It's the story of an American held in a dark Venezuelan prison. Then all of a sudden, they all kind of lined up. They pointed their guns at me. And this is the point where I thought, I'm going to die today. I'm Becky Bruce. I spent a year working on Hope in Darkness, which now has more than 2 million downloads. Find it on kslpodcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. In today's episode of Project Recovery, Lee Control, just a mile long, and when she said that, it went to one thing, me. That's it. That was it. And how I react. The court system was going to work at the court system pace. There was nothing. Make sure you listen to the end. Find us on Facebook at Project Recovery. We'll have that and much more coming up. Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery. And because of our friends at KnowYourScript.org, we are able to do this every week. We're going on three years, and we couldn't be more excited for our partnership with Know Your Script. If you want to find out more information on what they're all about, go to their website, KnowYourScript.org. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Uh, before the microphones turned on, we were talking about two important things. One was uh, our experiences with the soap opera Days of Our Lives. Right. Which I really liked it when I was a kid. I was a latchkey kid, so I'd go home and I'd watch Days of Our Lives. And uh, I was all in until Marlena got uh, possessed by the devil. Yeah, that, and then I was that like, wasn't cool. I tapped out. I that like, might have been the first thing that interested me in that show. No, I was show. like, I'm out, I'm out, you know what I mean? Yeah. And she talked in this deep voice, and it was just yeah. awesome. <laughs> no, it wasn't <laughs> that good. And you said you left school one time with some hot chicks to go watch Days yeah, of Lives. Yeah, there were some cute girls. They were a year older. They wanted to skip school, and so I went with them to watch Days of Our Lives, and I lasted maybe six minutes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is the most boring thing. I, I actually went back to school. <laughs> and it wasn't because I was afraid of ditching. I was just like, these girls are not cute. I mean, I mean, <laughs> there's nothing is worth this sitting through days of our lives. Oh my gosh. But more importantly, you were talking uh, about your workload. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and, and right now you're getting hit at every angle. Yeah. It's just, you know, I think every, I mean, I don't want to sound like a complainer, but I think everybody's life is probably like this. Some, I am in a job where people need things from me, not just patients, but, you know, at the university, academia, uh, colleagues, that sort of stuff. And this week has just, it's only midweek and it has already been off the hook. So I came in a little bit tired today, I think. No, but but I think that's really kind of what's going on with society right now. I think we're living in a pressure cooker, mm-hmm, and and, mm-hmm. and and something's got to give. And well, I, one thing I've noticed is so many businesses that shouldn't. My friend Eric posted on Facebook the other day a, a sign that that Burger King was closed because they didn't have enough employees to work that day. Yeah, well, Burger King. I, I'm with you, but that's what I'm saying is that everybody's trying to figure yeah. this out. And the way we relate it back to recovery is that my phone has been ringing a lot more. The Facebook messages have been link, re, uh, been yep. a lot more. And, yeah. and, and right now it's a perfect storm for addiction and recovery. People are trying to figure out where to make that decision, where to make that turn, and how do they get here? How do they get out? And mm-hmm. so uh, it, it's just, I think this is a time where we need to stop, take a deep breath, and figure out where what I learned in recovery is fix what you can fix. Mm-hmm. And that's what you need to do. You can't focus fix the, on what you can control. Yeah, you can't right. go back and do the past, and you can't predict the future. So you need to make those moves and changes within yourself, and then figure out which way you're going. And that goes for people who are in recovery or or struggling with an addiction. But but for people that that aren't struggling with an addiction, I think there's a lot of pressure. I brought up the the Burger King thing because it's like that's the third restaurant recently that I've noticed closed because they either didn't have enough supplies or they didn't have enough people to, to work. Middle of the day on Saturday, we were we went to this pizza place a few weekends ago, and, and the same thing, there's a note in the window. I just think everybody's under a lot of stress. I was thinking in my mind, what if I was the manager mm-hmm. of, of, of any of those restaurants? Oh, that's stressful to not be able to be open on a weekend when you make your most money, right? A local ski resort here in Utah called Snow Basin, they just canceled their summer concert series because they didn't have oh, enough employees to uh, sustain it throughout the whole tour. Where, where are all these people? Like, I have to work. <laughs> you have to work. Where, where are all these people that don't have to work? Is it st- 
stimulus money there? There wasn't that much stimulus I, money. I don't know. And I think people are trying to figure it out. And, uh, you know, here on the podcast, we like to stay a little bit topical and we want to be on, on brand. But you said you were reading an article. And, uh, oh yeah. So I get, so I get, uh, these, uh, you know, psychology and science type articles just kind of come across my email. All psychology the time. today. Yeah. Uh, well, no, real science articles. And, um, <laughs> and, and I get them all the time. And most of them don't really apply to anything I'm interested in or what I do. But a few of them do. And I try to catch, you know, read up on latest things. Two interesting articles that came out this week, research just this week. And I don't have them in front of me, so I'm not going to try to quote them. But one was, was on the relationship between suicidality, which mm-hmm. means both thinking about and attempting suicide, and uh, cannabis use. And they, the article kind of sets the stage by saying cannabis use uh, since uh, two, between 2008 and 2019, mm-hmm. so in that 11 year period, went up from went up uh, 60 to 60 percent. Forty uh, percent to sixty percent, so a twenty percent increase of people in the United States using in usage, in usage, right? And the the question was, does that also correlate with suicidal thinking and behavior? And the answer is yes. We've had a high correlation between the two. The article does point out that some further research needs to be done for various reasons, but the point in bringing that up today, it kind of surprised me because people nowadays talk about marijuana as almost like this cure-all. It's mm-hmm. going to fix your anxiety. Uh, it's better than uh, than drinking. Uh, it's not associated with um, violence. Ex- violence, but maybe it is, actually. And what we're finding is that we know it's associated with low performance. <laughs> People are not doing a lot if they're smoking a lot. That's mm-hmm. for sure we know that. And now we know that there seems to be a correlation between suicidality and marijuana use. So I thought that was interesting and important to bring up uh, to our guests and uh, – Oh, I'm going to forget the name of the book, but there's another book that was written by um, there's a book out written by um, a New York Times uh, writer who and it's called Tell Your Children the Truth About Marijuana. I think that's the name of the book. And I'm just barely starting to read it, so I'm not necessarily recommending it. But he's done some research that kind of is in the same vein as this article that we're talking about. Well, today. we expect a book report in a couple I'll months. I'll give you I'll give you a book. I'll, do, I'll have it read by next week. Ooh. Ooh yeah. I'm okay. a reader. And then, and then the next one, <laughs> the next one, uh, the next article, I'm going to quiz you on it. Uh, so the reason I stopped and read this article was the title. And it said, uh, uh, mortality, what's the mortality uh, percentage amongst cocaine using motorcyclists around the world. How's that for a title? Wow. And my first thought was, why do we need to do research on that? Because I think I know the answer. But what do you think? Does If you're a cocaine using motorcyclist around the world, uh, do, are you at higher risk for dying or lower risk for dying? Well, you asked me off air yeah. and I thought maybe... Th- Lower risk, but I didn't have any reasoning behind no. it. <laughs> you, you know, of course it's higher. You're right. Like, like you're on cocaine and you're riding a motorcycle. Good luck. And then it reminded me of this old comedian who uh, you tell this joke and he says, you know, he goes, I'd always want to drive next to a guy smoking weed than cocaine. Because if there was a guy smoking weed, he'd be like, he's all cautious and paranoid that he's going to hit anybody. And he can't really cause a wreck if you're going 10 miles an hour. He goes, but a guy on cocaine, he'd be like, I think I can make it. And he's taking chances. Well, now we have the scientific proof to prove that uh, joke true. So, uh, as to FYI, if you're thinking about uh, using cocaine and riding a motorcycle, don't. Yeah, I think okay. that's just solid advice <laughs> yes. all around the board. Really pretty good. And now we have some uh, science to back it up. I just thought it was funny. But but that's what I love about having you as a co-host is that you actually look into these things and you try to keep your finger on the pulse of what the community is talking about. And that's what we want to be is a resource here at Project Recovery for all things uh, and, and helping you out and navigate it. And then we also like to bring you a story of hope or inspiration at least once a week. And today we've got that story. His name is Bo Walker. We're excited to have him here. We're going to find out more about his story in just a few seconds. You're listening to Project Recovery. Two years ago, Americans watched in horror as a crisis unfolded at the Kabul airport. She was tear gassed and beaten. Images of thousands desperate to escape Taliban oppression filled our news feeds. More than 80,000 Afghans made it to America. 
But the story didn't end there. It was very cold. There was no power, no heat. Who would help our newest neighbors? I'm Andrea Smartin. In Stranger Becomes Neighbor, you'll hear the stories of some remarkable refugees who left their homes and their dreams behind only to start over from zero. Their only possession was three blankets. And you'll meet Americans who stepped up to help them. You want me to come when you deliver your baby. What can one person do in the face of an international disaster decades in the making? That's Stranger Becomes Neighbor. Find us at kslpodcast.com, follow us on Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else you listen. Welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. He's a clinical psychologist. That means he's the smartest guy in the room, or maybe he's not. Let's talk. Josh to- is here, though. Oh, Josh, yeah. Yeah, he's a pretty smart guy. And people don't know this, but Sexy Jesus cut his hair. He's looking good. Sharp. Yeah. Like clean cut Josh. I think he's getting ready to get back on the dating sites. I know he is. Yeah. Know and is. so you can find out more about him by go checking us out on Facebook. It's Project Recovery Podcast. We're going to put a picture up of you. But let's talk to our guest today. His name is Bo Walker. We've been trying to get you on the show for yeah. probably at least six months, wouldn't you say? Yeah, easily. Yeah, we talked about it and just schedules have not been able to, to jive, and today it did. So and it I'm out. excited to have you here. Bo Walker, let's hear your story. And we always like to go from the beginning. Hold on a second. Yeah. Does your microphone say Bo? Yes. Wow. He's got a microphone that says Bo. Man, I'm telling you what. He's the real deal. The stars are lining. <laughs> I think uh, Saturn's in retrograde or something. I don't even know I, if that well, means I anything. Well, I think we're the stars of professional aligned. today. The stars have aligned. Yeah. Where does the story of Bo Walker begin? Well, as a professional radio broadcaster, uh, we got these. Uh, during COVID, of course, everybody got their own. We yeah. have these little mic filters, and so that's how we, And they all are black. They didn't order any other colors. So I wrote my name on mine to keep me from spitting into somebody else's and vice versa. So. <laughs> So, anyway, Matt, great to meet you. And uh, Casey, you're looking good, man. You're looking Tony Robbins good, brother. You well, are, uh, yeah, well, well I'm, you know, I'm trying. <laughs> Killing it, man. But I'm doing everything I can. Uh Bo, where do you begin? How, how does it start with you? I, uh, I, I guess I could say I grew up in New Orleans. We moved there when I was was twelve. Yeah, I was born in California, didn't live there long. Lived in Texas for about six years, and when I was about twelve years old, we moved to uh, to New Orleans, which is a very very interesting place in the South. Uh, I can recall my best friend, one of the ones that I met, you know, had a keg in his house that he had access to any time. I mean, you know, it's crappy Dixie beer. It was terrible beer, but it was cold and it was there any time. And it just it, it, it fascinated me that after cutting the yard, he could go in and just tap himself a beer. And so part of the culture of New Orleans is uh, is drinking and party. It's nightlife. You know, it's a town that never sleeps. I actually went to New Orleans on my honeymoon with my mother and my ex-wife. And uh, that's a different story for a different time. But that town celebrates party and it's nothing but debauchery. It's, and and, yeah. and anywhere you go, I mean, it's, it's, it's here's a beer to go. Here's a window to pull a drink out of. Let's get a hurricane and let's just do this. And so I can understand. And the food, uh, it's just, you know, it's total overload. But what you're saying is even just just the average folks living there. Yes. So it's, it's not just it's not just Bourbon Street no. and tourists. Mardi Gras no, 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 and tourism. No, 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 it's no, no, like no. that's the actual culture of kind of the the people that live in and around the Absolutely. city. Absolutely. Okay. I was I was looking at just like you went you got back from what, Cancun? Uh, actually uh, Puerto Penasco. Puerto Penasco, okay. So in in New Orleans we call it the Redneck Riviera. We go to like uh, either Fort Walton or the Alabama coastline or Grand Isle, okay? Grand Isle, Louisiana, and I'm looking at people's pictures on Facebook, and they're having crab boils, and they're having, you know, fish fries and stuff like that. And I mean, that's how we grew up doing it, and it is. It's the culture. It's very laid back. Uh, we have crawfish boils during the summer. Uh, there is always a party. There is always a season. It starts, you know, I mean, from – you think, okay, after the first of the year, things are going to come. No, there's Mardi Gras. You know, and then there's the Irish parade, you know, and it just there's always something going on. And as a guy who decided on radio, um, this is my 40th year now. um, It was it's a good town to be in radio. You get in to get do an awful lot of stuff. And and I did, you know, you you, I, I started doing mornings in probably the mid 90s or so. And that's when the action really happens. You know, those are the money, you know, slots, uh, morning and afternoon drive. And that's 
I look back on it now and I, I think about all the people I got to meet and all the things that I got to do that other people just, it's not even going to be close, but you go backstage and you get to meet artists. And of course there's an open bar and it's sad to me now that of the people I know I met, I don't remember a lot about, and it's usually because I had to be this guy that was on all the time. Wow. Drop, drop a few names for us of big artists that you met, but that you, you maybe don't really remember much of your interaction. It, it's uh, it's interesting. You know, uh, Eddie Money, who just passed away recently, the first time I met him was at the Coast Coliseum in Biloxi, Mississippi. I was working at a, a station there called 93.7 QID, flamethrower radio station. Uh, this is right when he was starting to get sober too. This guy could not have been left in a room with a bottle of booze at that time. You know, he ended up getting sober. His daughter ended up playing bass for him. Great story. The whole thing. I met him again later on, but it was like, he's one of those ones where I know I met him. I know I went backstage, but because there was alcohol there, I don't remember a lot about it. Um, I worked for a light rock station. Michael Bolton was one. Oh, yeah. He had a traveling softball team. You know, did he have he his hair to at the time? Totally had his hair. I've got yes. some great pictures of that. that <laughs> and that's how I end up remembering some of this because we had a photographer and blah blah blah. And I was like, oh, I, oh, there I, I am. There, <laughs> I rem- I think I remember that. And it's sad that I don't remember a lot of yeah. these details. But I didn't realize it at the time. You know, I just thought I had to be this. Up, party jock, you know, go out every weekend, make sure I b- indulged in everything this town had to offer. And I didn't realize uh, the cost, you know, what it was costing me um, at that time. I figured, well, I'm just a social drinker because to do mornings, you can't drink during the week. But boy, on the weekends, I would binge drink, you know. You pack it in. You know, what yeah. you're saying really resonates with me because it, it, it describes a lot of what my early career was like. And it reminds me of this uh, Joe Walsh, and he went on tour with Ozzy Osbourne. And they asked him about it, and he goes, I don't remember it. Nope. But I know it happened because there's a poster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and, and But I remember getting kicked out of Midnight Oil's dressing room because I drank all their beer. I remember, you know, me and uh, the guy f- uh, from Counting Crows, he wasn't happy with me. And I look back now, and... And, you know, the story seems kind of funny, but in truth, they're really sad because I mm-hmm. had these – I could have had these authentic moments where I could have yes. talked to these guys and, and, and had, had a story. But now it's just it's just a blur, and, and, and that breaks my heart. It does. Because I had a lot of cool chances of uh, meeting people and idols and just threw it away because I was the same guy like you. Mm-hmm. Where's the open bar? That's it. Where's the Where's free the alcohol? Party? Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it's, it's sad. So do you remember when, is that when the alcohol really, you didn't have any problems in early childhood? Uh, no, not really. Um, I, I know when it got bad and it was a little bit later on, um, things started to change. You know, my marriage started to change. I had a kid and I was living in Mississippi and driving to New Orleans. I was off the air. I was program director at the time. It was a hundred mile ride there and a hundred mile ride back, and that was a daily commute. That was uh, I, because I still had a house in New Orleans and okay. one in Mississippi that I could stay there a couple days a week, which was problematic in its own self because I was the only one in the house. That meant I could still go out with my friends and party two days a week, show up hungover the next day because I was close. You know, I didn't have to, you know, have that drive. And I always told myself, I, you know, like, I, I can wait. I can wait until I get home to drink. And when the box of wine got strapped in and became my co-pilot on that ride home, I knew I had some problems. I was breaking all the promises to myself, you know. At least, you know, that was a boundary I had set. At least I'll wait till I get home. I don't know what I'm walking into. My wife, my ex-wife now is, a, is an alcoholic as well. And I didn't know how many ahead of me she'd be. I don't know what problems happened that day. But at least I said I can wait until I get home. And when that went away, it was like it was full on at that point. You know, it's interesting that he says that because we've had a lot of people on this podcast. And believe, believe it or not... Addicts do have some boundaries in the beginning. <laughs> in the beginning. I think that's actually the most common story. You know, right? in the beginning. People they're... making, like you're saying, Bo, making promises to themselves and setting boundaries and, well, I'll only drink at this time or yeah. just I beer. Yeah. Or just no, beer. No hard alcohol. Yeah. Anymore. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then those, those, Boundaries get fuzzy and and warped over time. Right? I mean, as stupid it is, there's that dumb country song. It's five o'clock somewhere. Yeah, you know, and that all came about to justify drinking at eleven o'clock. Yeah, you know, and 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 that's that's what we do is we trick ourselves or we get clever, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves uh, breaking boundaries that we set for ourselves that we said we'd never do, and then you do that, and then then the next one, and then it's pretty soon you're just fighting uh, to get whatever you can whenever you can. Mm-hmm. And in recovery, I find it's the same way. 
Um, you know, in one of the recovery places I was in, you didn't have to like make, make your bed, but at least throw your covers up Mm -hmm. in case they did a tour or something. And, you know, they wanted the place to at least look okay. And I knew that when I stopped doing that at home to let that little boundary go, it was really easy to let other, but I'm not going to the gym today. I don't feel like it. I'm not, you know, um, the the dirty dishes and the places, I'm not going to clean those up today. I was supposed to go meet a friend. I'm not going to do that. And it's like, I I just, I know that when that small little thing that I let go, it lets the bigger stuff go. And that is such a true behavior principle, whether it's applied to alcohol or just your daily life. Yeah. You know, if you, if you start to let the little things slip, uh, then the big things start to slip as well. And there is that um, commencement address by some general or colonel who talks about making, making your, your bed, bed yes. is the most important thing you do that day because if you get up and make your bed, you are, and, and there's research on this, you're much more likely to go to the gym, to do the dishes, to comb your hair, to shave, to do all these things that you're, make your, your day a success. Mm-hmm. But if you start off by hitting the snooze button and not making your bed, Boy, it's kind of downhill for most of us. That so that it's a true principle, whether it's just regular behaviors or alcohol or whatever. See, where I went to treatment, they said you make your bed first thing in the morning because if you've done nothing else, you've done at least one thing for the day. Yeah, you start off accomplished a goal. Yeah, with a goal. Yep. So when did so you said you're you you know you're strapping in a box of wine into your car, you're going home to. But I'm kind of curious. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt. I'm kind of I'm going back to this. I got this 12 year old in a keg in my head still. So I'm just kind of curious. When you moved there and you you were introduced to this culture it may not have become a problem but did you start like having a a lousy dixie beer with your buddy at 12 or or how old were you when you first had your first drink absolutely um i was like hey what's this and i definitely did it was a nice cold uh you know dixie beer and then mardi gras comes around and i didn't know what it was and you know they call it carnival uh it's a two-week period uh, that floats according to easter and they started taking me to the parades. And, of course, they were a little older than I was, so I kind of just followed suit. And, of course, you know, they were drinking at the parades and stuff. And, and basically anywhere you go – here's a funny story. We do a lot of, uh, you know, 5Ks and charity walk runs and things like that. We attach ourselves, you know, Casey, to, to, to certain charities that, that we either have a, a connection to or what have you. Um, I can just tell you right now that if you have uh, a first annual and there's not a beer truck and a food truck at the end of this, there will not be a second annual. <laughs> it's over. So that's just that's the culture. That the it's requirement. This, this healthy thing that you're doing for kidney disease or for, you know, juvenile diabetes or whatever. If there's not a, the, a party at the end of this, there's not a second annual. No one's coming. Yeah. And that's just kind of the culture of the whole thing. And growing up in that culture, my dad. Uh, owned his own business. It's one of the reasons that we we moved to uh, to New Orleans, and he did an awful lot of business out. You know, um, when I was bored, I I wanted to play an instrument, so I decided to play the drums. I started learning how to play the drums, and my dad would call me. I was probably I don't know fifteen, sixteen by then, and he'd call me, you know, uh, on a school night and say, uh, you know, hey, Bo, uh, grab your mom's keys. Larry London's playing at the whatever whatever club. I think I can get you to sit in. And I mean, this is my dad, you know, and then. I'm driving him home, you know, but he did an awful lot of business. And that just kind of, again, became the culture of New Orleans. You did. I, I look at the Uber now and all of the driving. We didn't have any of that. We just drove to the next bar and kept going, you know, and because and I, I think about this because I got in some terrible trouble and it's what made me get sober. But I think about all the times I got pulled over in New Orleans and was able to talk my way out of a DUI because of who I was. I used my influence. I had, you know what I mean? And, and that's how unauthentic my life was. I was this character that I played on the radio. I couldn't separate the two. Somebody told me a long time ago, they said, Bo, you know, who you are is not what you do. And I didn't know what he meant at that time. No, I am. I'm this Corvette driving. I'm this fast living. I'm married, but a kind of a single life. And I just thought this was who I really was. And I couldn't separate the two. And then when I started going to treatment, you know, I was almost 50 years old and you're sitting in a group circle and you're trying to figure out who the hell you are at that age. It's tough. It's tough because you've been so unauthentic your entire life. I think that's a great point because uh, uh, people our age uh, are going to remember what what celebrities you DJs were yeah. back in those days. I mean, that was you were like the Cowboys. You were very, very cool driving Corvettes, doing all that big living, hanging with the artists. I think nowadays younger people don't quite get no. that what 
that, you know, from the 60s to the 90s, like what that 30 year period it was like. But you bring up a really interesting psychological point. I think everybody to some degree is in danger of what you just said, but especially if you have celebrity, celebrity. and yeah. that is uh, confusing who you really are with with the the persona you've created the character as you said that you've created and that creates an internal dichotomy or stress like you don't you go home and you don't really feel like you and i think casey's talked about that a lot going home and kind of feeling like well am i really casey scott or am i casey scott you know yeah yeah like who am i and you go home and and if if you don't have that celebrity around you to kind of remind you that you're the character then you have to go home and battle with Am I am I me or am I the character? And that can be really confusing, very frustrating, and often so difficult that you want to numb it out with with alcohol, drugs. Well, I can tell you this right now because people, you know, five ten years ago, Casey Scott's this fun loving guy who's always on the move and doing cool stuff. Well, I and think it, a lot of people remember you from your road tripping days, yeah. and your job looked like the most fun. And it was and it was a blast. But then I would sit there and go. They think Casey Scott is this. Casey Scott is a sad sack sitting on his back deck all alone, drowning his sorrows in a 12 pack. Yeah. yeah. So, so. But you had to be both, though. Yeah. And Bo had to be mm-hmm. both. And I just think it's fun to reminisce about the days when the, the biggest celebrities, besides the guys playing the guitars, were the DJs. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I just think a lot of my kids nowadays wouldn't quite understand that yeah. but there was a good third all my life growing up you kind of tune into your favorite dj and you want to find out what they're doing and they're just living this life and and in reality you end up creating a duality of two different lives and and i put i picked the perfect career for me actually you know it was a, a crash course because i didn't like me i wanted to be anybody else but me of course i didn't work on core issues until i started going to treatment i had never seen a therapist you know i was like goodwill hunting i'd sit on the couch and go, okay let the healing begin what do we do i had no, <laughs> I had no clue uh there's kind of a staple here on the podcast hmm. and that would be someone's rock bottom and wow uh, i'd I, love to tell you that story i mean I, I i think we'd like to get to know how at 50, you decided recovery was the road for you. After yeah. living this fast life, this dual life, it sounds like a, a failed marriage. You have a son. I mean, where does it all come to a point where you go, I'm done, I'm out? Um, I thought, it, as most uh, addicts, you, you hit rock bottom. I had several. Um, I went seven times through treatment. Um, the first time I went was around 2011 and had knew nothing about recovery. Now, did you go through it just to appease people around you or did you go because you thought you needed it? Because we've had a lot of people on this where their first uh, venture into a treatment facility was just to prove to everybody else. They make didn't your have boss a- happy, make your wife yeah. happy, make, you know, like, yeah. yeah. I knew that I needed to go and so I thought, well, I'm doing the right thing here. Uh, like most families of addicts who go to treatment, you think, well, I'm going to go do my 30 days and then I'm going to be cured and I'm going to come back and everything's good. You're not cured. You know that. <laughs> and so I did that. I filled up my FMLA paperwork. I thought, you know, I was really worried about, you know, going back and, you know, what people are going to say. That first experience at that treatment center, it was in, uh, in Navarre Beach, Florida. It was terrible. I knew nothing about treatment at that time. Ended up having to go back. And the way I got to Utah was because the ones that I had went to before were all 12-step. And I just hated 12-step. I love it now. I hated it. I don't know. Well, I know why I was brushing well, that off. Until recently, that was the the main and only promoted uh, way of getting sober and staying yeah. sober. Don't and, drink. Believe in God. You know, go to meetings. And for a lot of people. And make amends. Make amends. And, and, and the principles are great. But for a lot of people, it just doesn't click and they yeah. give up on treatment. Yeah. So I Google, uh, you know, non-AA based, uh, you know, because I had to go again. I mean, I was spinning out of control. And I found Turning Point over here in Sandy. And the only reason I knew Sandy, I'm a long-distance motorcyclist, so I would, you know, go 10, two weeks, sometimes 10 days, two weeks at a time on a motorcycle all the way from New Orleans or Mississippi, come out west here. Ever cocaine on the motorcycle? Uh, No, but I can tell you a funny story about that. It's going to be quick, too. The only time I've ever been down on my motorcycle, been in an accident, is when I've been higher drunk. That's it. Been down three times, and that's the only time I've ever been down is when I've been higher drunk. Well, that'll do it. That'll do it. (laughs) So so Dr. Matt's right then. 
Totally. Yeah. And, 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 Good information, <laughs> Dr. Math. That wow. was another boundary I set was I was not ever going to drink and ride again. And the second rehab place I went to, I rode my motorcycle because I knew I would at least show up sober. Oh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't break that boundary. Well, I have a motorcycle, too, and I can't imagine trying to drive a motorcycle drunk or high. So you're uh, spinning, it's terrible. You're yeah. spinning yeah. out of control. You Google non-12-step treatment centers. Mm-hmm. And it brings you to Utah. Yes, yes, uh, to Sandy, Utah. So for uh, number one, that was in uh, October of 2014, I went to Turning Point. And that's where, in addition to trying to get, you know, the nuts and bolts of what your addiction is, you work with a therapist. And for the first time... You sit down and you have to take a really hard look at who you are. A little and, inventory, unpack, uh, unpack some stuff. It's it's try to figure out maybe why you drill down became yes. an addict. Well, right? he said it just about ten minutes ago. You didn't like yourself. You wanted myself. to be anything but yourself. Yes, and I was able to hide in radio. I could be anybody I wanted. I changed names dozens of times. Uh, any you know, new town, new persona. Uh, you could be anybody you wanted to be. And I was able to hide in that for a long period of time. So I went to treatment there. I don't know. I extended, probably did 45 days. You get out feeling good. You got this new tool belt. You got this new way of talking. You Living got, in the pink cloud. The pink cloud Anything's is Anything's awesome. possible. I can go home and deal. My wife says this. I use an I feel statement, and I'm going to do some reflective, <laughs> reflective listening. listening. Yeah. Do, I've got all these killing wonderful it. tools, man, and I've got yeah. it on it. And, 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 and I relapsed very quickly i go back i go back i go back i go back um the so last how many time, times did you go back to turning point uh f- i ended up four times at turning point and uh it was the last time that finally took because i had nothing else but you were at least smart enough it sounds like to go back i yeah. mean you know a lot of times uh we've met people on here and i met people in the streets and they go oh it's, treatment's not for me i gave it a shot once it's just, you know, I, I just, that's not going to work for me. And I think it was the one thing that was working for me with my son. You know, my son knew that he was growing up with two alcoholic parents. And I think the reason that, you know, he liked me was he said, Dad, at least you're trying. You know, Mom is never going to go. And she hasn't to this day. She will never go. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, I still have a relationship with her. We share a son. And, you know, but that was the one thing that always stuck with me. He said, Dad, at least you're trying. You know, I love my sober dad. I don't like my drunk dad. And it's funny. It's not really funny. It's sad because that is what ended up getting me sober is that in um, I was living out here at the time. I spun out really bad in April of 2017, um, decided, you know what? I'm paying for this big house over in Mississippi. You know what? I'm going to go to treatment. I'm going to finish that. I'm going to pack my stuff and I'm going to move back home and I'm going to move into my house with my wife that I'm not getting a bad idea. It was a terrible idea. Oh yeah. I relapsed very, very quickly. And then in December of 2017, um, my son and I had an altercation and I have a concealed carry permit and I had my pistol on me at the time. Uh, Police come, I go to jail uh, the whole thing, restraining orders. Um, you find out who your friends really are. I slept on people's couches uh, until they kicked me out because even then I didn't stop uh, drinking and they were pot smokers. So I indulged in that as well. I ended up <clears throat> in a small town in uh, Louisiana called Raceland, Louisiana with a buddy of mine. It's not the end of the earth, but you can see it from there. <laughs> um, and he he said, you know, you're welcome to stay there as long as you can. And I was just getting really depressed. It's nothing but cane fields and cow fields. And I got turned down at like uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. I mean, you know, I went and applied to try to get any job. And I mean, come on, I was super overqualified. And we wouldn't even hire me. I was just depressed. I'm augering in. I'm thinking about eating a bullet. I know exactly how I'm going to do it. I'm going to go in the cow field so my buddy doesn't have to deal with this. And I just did not like where my head was at. And um, I reached out to uh, Chris McIntosh, who's now the the CEO at Turning Point, who was just in admissions when I was starting to go there. And I said, Chris, I don't like where my head's at. Um, And I probably won't have it on my shoulders very much longer unless I can get some help, man. What can you do for me? He says, well, give me a bit. Let me talk to um, not only Dan, who was still there, Dan's CEO at Aqua now. Uh, but Kathy, who had gotten me in there back in there a couple of times as well, they called me back and he says, OK, can you get here? I said, I can get here. Can you be sober? I said, yep, I can get here sober. 
And um, I said, so am I going back to residential? And he went, no, you do really good in residential, which I do. I kill residential. I'm the <laughs> best at it. If there was a trophy awarded for residential, I would be number one. I do the book work perfectly. I understand the language. I feed back to you exactly what you want to hear. I'm really good at residential. I can imagine. I can imagine. And so he went, no, nah, we're not going to do that. Uh, we just flipped one of our uh, small houses into a residential, into a, a, a transitional Uh, so you're going to go to transitional living. I was like, all right, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't care. I had a place to go and I drove out there and on the 22nd of January in 2018, that's where I went. Um, and because I had no other place to go, I had restraining orders against me. No one was talking to me. My family wanted nothing to do with me. I get that. My son wasn't talking to me. Uh, the, the court allowed me to reach out to him electronically only one time a day, either email or text. The first text I sent him, he gave me the thumbs up icon, and I didn't hear from him again for an entire year. Wow. An Do you remember what you, you sent to him? Well, at first it was, in my manipulative way, what can I say that's going to make him answer me? Okay? This is my, and I'm seeing my therapist at the time. And she says, well, first off, maybe you ought to just back off. Okay? Don't text him every day. Maybe every two or three days. He, maybe he needs some time as well, some space. And I said, okay, that's good. And she says, you know, when you text him, instead of with that in mind of what's going to make him answer me, you know, I'm going to say something that's going to make him want to have to answer me. He says, why don't you just, if you were standing in front of him, text what it is that you, that you want to say to him. Make it personal. Just make it personal yeah. and from the heart. I know you've apologized. I know all of that. You've done it many, many times about what happened. But just talk to him. And that's what I started doing. I started just texting what I felt that day because I was really starting to understand who I was at that point. And it's exactly what I needed. I needed – nobody but my mother was talking to me. That was it, my mom. And I lost my mom this past January. It was terrible for me because she was the only one that was speaking to me at that time. Um, and it, it – it was quite a learning experience. I had to take it seriously. I ended up going to sober living for a year because I had no place to go. You know, I was 90 days already in transitional, which nobody says 90 days in transitional. It's, it's meant to be there five, six days until you find something else. Mm-hmm. They kept me there, Was went to day treatment, went to IOP, and I'm watching some of the people in transitional uh, checking out sober livings. And I'm like, what's this sober living about? I had a terrible idea of what it was. It was like, you know, uh, 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 shower curtains and cots and guys shooting up. And and I I was in a million dollar house. It was great. You know, over in Draper, it was (laughs) ended up working out. I never thought in a million years as a 50 something year old man, I'd be living with seven, 20 or 30 something year olds, but it was the best thing I could do for me. It, it, it kept me, uh, accountable. Um, I had to have a job and that's when I started working in the, um, the, the field, Uh um, in the recovery recovery field. Uh, I was a cook. Uh, I was at Cirque Lodge for a while cooking there. I cooked at Deer Hollow for a bit. I loved Deer Hollow. They handled first responders. Um, I cooked at Turning Point for a little bit. But because of my background, because I had a DV on my background, no one was going to hire me. And I lost all of those jobs. Aqua hired me over in Midway. when I For those who don't know, DV is domestic violence. Domestic violence, yes. I was looking at two felonies. Uh, and you know, for the first time in my life, and I thought about this and I brought it up before how many times I'd gotten out of the cops and the trouble that I was in, Uh huh. I thought, okay, I'm gonna get me a good old boy lawyer. Uh, you know, I'm going to have him, I'm going to get out of this somehow. And I thought, you know, to do this, I'm going to have to put my son on the stand and call him a liar. And that's not a really good way to try to repair a relationship with your son. No. And someone that you want to have a relationship with the rest of your life. And I said, you know what? This is it. For the first time in my life, I'm going to be accountable. I'm going to be a stand-up guy. Whatever that judge says, I'm going to do. I'm going to have my lawyer do his thing. But whatever it is, if I go, he says jail, and that's all they were offering was jail. There was no plea. There was no, oh, it's a first-timer. There's no this. Really? The only thing my lawyer was coming back with me was jail. How I, much? Um, we never got that far, but it would have been a minimum of six months, I know. You know, for a guy that's never been to jail, the three days I spent in jail in Pascagoula, Mississippi, was not pleasant for a white boy like me. <laughs> if you've ever been to Pascagoula, Mississippi. Never been. Yeah, you don't want to. I also get the sense of maybe... 
maybe it was a little frustrating because back in Mississippi, New Orleans, that area, you were somebody or mm-hmm. your character, your persona was known. And it, it it maybe gave you a sense of power, even though it was inauthentic. Here in Utah, I'm not sure, did people, like you didn't have that same Were they cachet. by you? No, but I Nobody. got to start again, guys. Uh-huh. I use my real name now. People call me by my real name, and it's weird. Because <laughs> I never used it. I did business in it. I bought cars and motorcycles and houses and set up lines of credit in it. But nobody But nobody called, called you that. Not even my family. No and Casey's way. real name's Eugene. No, there it's you not. Have it. It's Casey. <laughs> there you go. I remember the day we sat down, and that's when I started with uh, 107.5 The End. And they were like, what do you want your name to be? And I was like, Casey. Oh, yeah. Casey. And they go, yeah, but you can pick any name. I said, I'm pretty cool with Casey Good Scott. Good with Casey, huh? Because I was smart enough. Well, maybe not, because I'm, well. But you I didn't want to name yourself after a Mexican burrito no, or anything? No, but I knew when this ended, I would have to be me. And I always want, and I always just wanted well, to be me. that's pretty good, because back in the day, yeah. you, the, being a DJ, you got to pick a name. And as soon as you start getting called by some other name, you create a different persona, Give me three right? of your exactly. best names you've gone by. Uh, I was uh, Wild Man Walker at 93.7 QID. <laughs> it was the best, man. That was the best time I ever had. In radio. You mean yeah. People called you Wild Man, I well, bet. People yep. still. Hey, there's a Wild Man! And, that, and that's the funny part is that I know where, like if people call by what they call me, and if I see them again, I know exactly where I was at that time. So if uh, they called me Wild Man, I knew I was in Biloxi, Mississippi during, nine, you know, a, a, a period of time, you know, 89, 90, whatever it was. So um, I, I'm, I'm Bo Walker now. I'm Alan Hughes on uh, FM 100.3. I was BJ Fox. I was the Doc of Rock. I was a scrub tech for a the while. So, of I, rock. so I would I yes. would get off of scrubbing at this hospital, right? Passing instruments like Margaret Houlihan on MASH, you yeah. know what I mean? Stat, yeah. stat. And so I still have my scrubs on, and I do this 7 to midnight show at KXOR in Thibodeau, Louisiana, right? Judas Priest at 8 o'clock in the morning was awesome. <laughs> it was a great rock station. He was the Doc of Rock. I was the Doc of Rock. Love it. Uh, who else? I, I mean, I, I was, you know, 10, 12 names, and, and I just changed names. Before we get talk about your recovery, uh, what do you think made sense to you at Turning Point? Because you Googled non-12-step based treatment faci- mm-hmm. facilities. And you went back four times or so. So yes. what was their, what was, how did they do it? Um, again, it's therapy-based. It's DBT, CBT. Um, cognitive based therapy. And that's dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. The idea is that in those kinds of therapies, you're really digging deep and looking at your patterns, your habitual patterns of thinking and behavior, the stuff that we're not even really aware that we do no. and realizing how much of that is leading to the, to the negative outcomes that we're trying to get rid of. And then this is the kind of therapy that's work. And in fact, I usually uh. tell people the best analogy for this kind of therapy is going to the gym it's training what we do know is it's hard work we also know that most people quit early and they don't get the results they want but we also know if you keep going to the gym you're gonna get fit yep and if you keep doing this kind of therapy but it's hard work isn't it it's terrible the heavy lifting is uh immense it's brain work it's having to look at yourself a way you've never looked at yourself before and you don't want to nobody wants to see the warts and the ugly stuff man and when you start to uncover that and you realize Oh, man, I'm that a-hole. I'm that guy that I hate of everybody else. I'm that guy. And you start to look at your core issues and you see how it shaped everything about what you've done up to this point. And you have to take accountability for it. It it was finally at that point where I took accountability for whatever the judge was going to say. I'm going to do. I'm going to ride this out. And I'm taking accountability. I had to go back through my life. And take accountability for everything. I knew my story. I knew what I told you. And I knew what I told myself about what happened. And then I knew the truth. And I buried the truth. That's the thing, though, too, is is that there's so many lies going on. There's lies to other people. There's lies to yourself. And I got so good at lying to myself <sighs> that you could have got me up on on a like a, a, a stand and they said, tell, tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And that's the story I would have told you totally. because I believed it that much. Oh, yeah. I, I, people, we have this tremendous capacity to convince ourselves mm. of our own warped reality. It, it reminds me of that Seinfeld where George turns to Jerry and he says, Jerry's trying to figure out how to lie and he doesn't know how to lie. And, and, and George is like, I can't help you, man. Sorry. And then as he's leaving, he turns and he says... Just remember, Jerry, it's not a lie if you believe it. If you believe it. And and uh, that's funny slash sad because 
back to cognitive behavioral therapy, if you really dig deep, no matter how functional you think you are, you have some of those lies. We all do. Yes. And sometimes they, you know, to to promote and keep an addiction going for decade after decade, those lies stack up and stack up and stack up. And it's a lot of work to remind yourself, oh, wait a second, that's not true. That was a lie I told myself for 20 years. Here's the truth. Unpacking that, like you said, is really tough work. And people don't believe that. They don't understand that. That when you're doing EMDR Mm -hmm. or you're doing brain spotting, um, uh, neurofeedback, all of this stuff, the CBT, all of the groups, all of the therapy sessions, this is all brain work. And it is. It's exhausting. It is exhausting. It's um, emotionally draining because when you have to get truthful with yourself and stop telling yourself the lies and believing the lies, and because we all know what happened. I know the truth. Again, I know the story I told you, and I know the story I convinced me was true. But to make myself look better, I told these stories, and I manipulated. I wanted outcomes. You know, I, I've often said that, you know, a lot of people have a fear of, of failure. I had a, f- a fear of success. You know, every place I went, I always did better. It's like, okay, now do I go to a top 10 market? And if I succeed in the top 10, should I go to a top two? What if I get there and I can't perform this way? So I'd make up some excuse as to why I didn't get it or why it wasn't right for me or whatever. I was the fear of the success. What if I can't keep up? Because I knew that this persona, this person that I was, was spinning out of control. What would I be in a top 10 market? You know? How terrible would that be? Limiting yourself because you're thinking, well, I I can't get there. I, the person I'm becoming isn't going to make it there. They're going to figure me out. Totally. So I'm going to stay here at this level where I've got people snowed yeah. and myself snowed. But the reality might catch up with me at that top 10. So I better hang back. Is that yeah. what you're saying? I know I'm yeah. a fraud and we all have that. You know, oh my yeah. God, what if they figure out I really don't know what I'm doing? You know, luckily right. in the 40 years of me doing this. I feel I have some confidence and I kind of know what I'm doing uh, with this particular job. But, you know, back then, yeah, that's absolutely what it was. It was that fear of success, not necessarily failure. But unpacking all that stuff in residential, you know, in treatment and IOP and continuing with the therapist and finding these things out about yourself can be ugly work. But then, you know, there comes a time where I just had to draw the line and say, you know what? I'm going to be authentic. I'm going to be accountable. I'm going to stop manipulating. I'm going to stop negative talk to myself. I mean, I had to make these decisions in order to stay sober. And I think going to the sober living uh, was a big help because there was accountability there as well. And and I've always tell people because I work in the business now and I tell people the longer you can stay, the better chance you give yourself of staying sober in the long run. Because I left too soon every time and I did no aftercare. But you kept you kept coming back to Turning Point, which sounds like for you was aptly named. <laughs> and and, <laughs> yeah. and you're saying, but it was all this really, really hard work. There must have been, and, and the 12-step programs that you went to, weren't effective. You didn't particularly care for them, but you can hide a little bit easier in a 12 step program, right? You sit in the room and you can say what you're supposed to say in front of the group and, and all of that you memorize. And, and I'm sure you, you could snow most people there, but in, in the, the therapy based uh, recovery program, there must've been something you wanted because that's harder than going hiding out in a 12 step room. Did you feel like things were like, did you realize this is what I need, even though it's really hard and I'm leaving early and I'm not doing the follow up treatment like I should. But deep down inside, it, I'm guessing there, there was the little voice inside that said, you need to come back and keep doing this work. I needed to find out who I was. And yeah. that's what it was. I got a little taste of it. You know, the first time a therapist looks at you and you get one of those head slapping moments and you go, oh, wow. Uh Oh, he sees me. <sighs> yeah. And and it's like. I I'm scared of this. But I have to do this. If I need if I am going to get off of this roller coaster, I have to do this. I have to figure out who I am. And it was very difficult because of the celebrity. I think it was even more difficult because I had hidden behind that for so long. And by unpacking all of that stuff, making my peace with it, like you said, in the very beginning, you say, you know what? I can't change the past. I can't future trip either. I can be mindful. I can live in the present. What can I control at this moment? And because I was spinning out when I went back, 
I was looking at uh, uh, charges, you know, felonies. I had no place to go, no place to live. I had no money. I had nothing. All of this stuff. The lump in the rug that I was sweeping under there was so big, I was tripping. I couldn't get out of my own way. And finally, there was a therapist at Turning Point when I was in IOP that she says, look, I get it. You know, you're trying to process a whole bunch of stuff, but you're never going to be able to move forward unless you compartmentalize some of this stuff. You're not forgetting it. You're not. You, we're just going to move it out of the way a little bit, allow you to work on you, and then you're going to pull that back in and we'll work on it. So from this point, what can you currently control? And I had this list a mile long. And when she said that, it went to one thing, me. That's it. That was it. And how I react. The court system was going to work at the court system pace. There was nothing I could do about that. That's going to come up when my lawyer calls and says, hey, you got to be back here on the 23rd. Okay, I'll deal with that then. My family not talking to me. Is there anything you can do about it? Nope, not right now. Move that out of the way. And so it allowed me the space to work on me and to work on the stuff because, man, I was feeling low. I was I was lower than whale poop, man. I mean, I did not feel good about myself at all. I had messed up everything I felt. Nothing is fixable. I just had this fatalistic attitude, and it wasn't until I started small. It's funny, you know, we talk about negative self-talk and how you talk to yourself. And, you know, a little thing like you drop a pencil and you go, ah, oh, you dummy, you know, or whatever. And you pin down and pick it up, and you don't even think about it. But Negative that, automatic thoughts, gnats. That's gnats, what we, yep. totally gnats. And when that came up in, in IOP and I said, OK, uh, I don't think I do that. I do. But I thought, OK, I'm going to count. And so I started counting. And at some point you stop yourself. The rest of the exercise, as you know, is to give yourself a compliment to tell yourself, you know, OK, you know, you're not a dummy. You just dropped a pen. You know, you're a fairly smart guy. You went to college. You just dropping you, pens is not an IQ test. Exactly. Yep. And so instead you look at yourself and you say, you know, but I'm a really good person or whatever it is. I never got to that point because I'm still only at the like me stage. I'm not at the love me stage yet, but I can look at myself in the mirror at night and go, I didn't screw anybody over today. I didn't lie, cheat, steal. I didn't manipulate. And thank God I did not use. And so it started with that little exercise of me counting how many times. Mm -hmm. And then it would be like if I did drop something, I'd go, you, uh," and I'd stop myself. Mm-hmm. And I was like, hmm, okay. Then I eliminated it all together. And that was one step in moving forward in my That's confidence That's a huge step, building. though. It huge was. step. For me, it was. We talk on the show a lot about thoughts, feelings, behaviors, that mm-hmm. kind of pattern. And if you start with a negative thought, and it's so automatic that you're not even fully aware of it, there's no way the next thing, which are the feelings that are going to come, can be positive. No. And if you're not feeling positive, if you're feeling negative about yourself – what chance are your behaviors to be productive, right? So thoughts, feelings, behaviors. If if every day I'm walking around telling myself what a dummy I am, I'm my mood's always going to be low, and my behaviors are going to be less than stellar. Yeah. And that and that can that can last a day, a month, a year, a decade, you know. And so overcoming that, doing that exercise, that's actually a huge shift towards healthy, productive self care. And I needed to do that. It was just like making the bed thing. I needed to start small. I thought I had this mountain that was so massive that I was never going to fix, never going to get over. And I said, you know what? You're never going to if you don't try and start somewhere. And that was really like my first exercise of trying to unpack all the stuff that I had, you know, and just go, you know what? Concentrate on you right now. The rest of this stuff is going to play out. We just keep living the right way, keep doing the right thing. Knowing that we're standing in our truth and being honest and accountable for what's happening and good things are going to continue to happen. So we're not messing with the process, which I never thought I'd do because I, I thought I was controlling everything. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm driving the bus, right? I'm oh, making yeah. this happen. Right. And, and control is such an illusion, right? For sure. Yeah. So, you know, when we sat down to do this podcast, I said, Dr. Matt, the smartest man in the room. <laughs> and I think you're really smart. <laughs> but I've learned so much from listening to you today, Bo. Oh, and, I have too. Uh, I mean, I have I, too. You, you have a wonderful story. You have a wonderful outlook. And I think you're going to be hope and inspiration to so many out there who have listened to this podcast if people want to find out more information you know about what you're doing uh where would they go well i i work at um uh, chateau recovery now i work here at the stations as well i, I just made two years which, congratulations yeah, yeah. yeah and, that's awesome. know, and i didn't know if i was ever going to go back to radio because at what cost came back up again what if i do this and i'm unauthentic again and i become this person i don't want to be and so luckily for me 
you know, it worked out. I love working here. I love the people I work with. You know, it's a great company. Uh, I don't know. I don't have a website or anything. Um, but and FM 100, they don't play Judas Priest at 8 o'clock in nope, the morning. Nope, that's not so happening. He's not sure. the Docker that's, Rock there. He's not I'm the Docker Rock Zach anymore. Rock. <laughs> well, uh, that's right. Well, my, my takeaway from today is that old little cutesy saying, mighty oaks from little acorns grow. And I love your message of start with something small that you can control, focus on that, and watch it grow into something that is authentic and successful. And I'm so happy that you were able to come on today and share that message. Yeah. And be patient. You know, oh, and it, it I, is patient. I learned patience. You know, you know what? I, people no. go, I just want to get better. And I go, it took you a while to get where you were. It's going to take a while to get back. Yeah. The thing I want people to walk away with uh, the podcast today is that it's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get up. Definitely. And, you know, for those who say, you know, we're going to try recovery once. Well, for some yeah. people, that works. For others, it don't. I think you need to keep going back to that well until you got what you need. Yeah. Well, that's definitely what you did, right, Bo? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I knew I needed to continue to go back. I mean, I was ready to end my life. I was ready to, which would have ended my pain, but it would have killed my mother a whole lot earlier. What would it have done to my son, you know, my wife? The people that I left behind would just have inherited this pain. And I thought, you know what? That's not fair. Let me go fix this. I caused this. Let me unravel this and let me fix this. Last question. How is your relationship with your son today? Awesome. He lives with me. <laughs> really? I'm sending him back on a flight uh, early August back to spend the summer with his mom. But, yep, I drove him to Sandy every day to finish the little charter school over Beehive. Um, uh -huh. and yeah. he, uh, graduated this year. Oh, great. Um, he lives with me. I, again, you know, everything is fixable, but it takes time. The thing it taught me was patience. And it's funny for a guy, this happened when he was 15, 16 years old, right? When I finally talked to him again, I was like, man, you know, did you at least get my messages? You know, how come you didn't answer? He said, dad, I heard about everything you were doing. I knew you were doing well. And I didn't want to get in the way of that. And I thought, wow, how insightful, man. Pretty Don't mature. mess up my recovery. Because it would have. I would have immediately, because I would have fixed that. And now I would have switched gears and gone back to old me. And by him teaching me that patience piece, by I can fix stuff, but it's not in my time, it's in your time. Cool. I say trust the process, and yep. I want to say thanks to everybody for stopping by and listening to Project Recovery today. Don't forget, Project Recovery is brought to you by Know Your Script, and Project Recovery is a KSL podcast. Thanks, Bo. Thank you, guys. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk. I'm Dave Cauley, investigative journalist and host of the podcast, Cold. Don't miss Cold's new Season 3, where I look into the unsolved disappearance of Cherie Warren, a woman last seen leaving her job at a Salt Lake City office in 1985. Police cast suspicion on Cherie's estranged husband and boyfriend, but never made any arrests or recovered Cherie's remains. Find Cold Season 3, The Search for Cherie, anywhere you get your podcasts.